There are two in there. It would be best to have you guys here. Join me here. All right. Well, I think you guys might be viewing the uh, the hangout passively. If you can, I just added another chat, another link in the uh, in the chat for the meeting, the go-to meeting. Click on that last link and see if you can hop inside the actual hangout with us. There you are. Hello. Let me Hello. hang up the other one person. Okay. Yeah, Ali can log out of go to meeting and we shall use Justin's hang on. All right. And you may want to send out that link to everybody because I think we just have one person viewing, but we had five people in that other okay, chat. Okay. Wait, why can't I see you? Can you see me? I can. Okay, great. But I don't know why you're not on my main screen. Huh. Do, you, do you see the Hangout window at all? Yeah, I mean, I see you as a small screen on my right corner, but not as the main, main video when you speak. What, what about here? Have you um, click on click on? What do you see in the main video? Do you see yourself? Okay. It's okay now. Okay. Okay, great. And can you tilt the camera down a little bit so I can see who's who's in your audience? All right. Just let me show you around who's who. Mm -hmm. So this is everyone. Um. So you have Sam, Myrash, and the teens behind. And here are the guys from the Philippines, Singapore, India team, the Lithuanian team, the Indonesian team. Very good, very good. Nice to see you guys. Can you guys all hear me? Yes, we have a speaker, so you're loud and clear. All right, great. All right, uh, so. And do you want to give any, give any introduction or should I just rock and roll? Um, can you do a short introduction if you want? Do you want to start with Sorry, what sure. was that? Okay, okay. I'm Sam. Sure, no? Okay, I'm Sam. Uh, guys from Obelus, right there. We're from Thailand. Well, I, I can. Uh, oh, you can hear? Uh, I, I can hear. <laughs> Sorry, we got a lot of echo. Over here. One more time. Sorry, who is speaking? Okay, here I'll, I'll turn the camera on for a second. Okay, can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Am I supposed to see someone? It, are, are you with Fanny, or are you uh, calling remotely? One of the one of the guys on the screen here. It's um, Stuart from Newton. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, very good. <laughs> you see me now? Uh, I can't. I can't see your video, but I can. I know who you're talking. I know who. Okay, I'll just introduce myself uh, via audio then. So okay. my name is Sam, and I'm here with my team called Obelis. And uh, we are from Thailand doing a crowd curated shopping site, kind of a la fancy polyvore when you love. Gotcha. Okay, fantastic. And are you in the same room as Fanny? Yeah, we're all in the same room. Okay, but you have your own camera set up there, is that right? Yes. I can turn it off if you want or I I see, I see. Okay. So then we'll just have to be careful with the microphone because it can it can pick up both of you guys, but I think we'll we'll give it a shot and see how it goes. Okay. Um, no, I, I sorry. Uh, on introductions, um, I I would. Here's what I want to do. I want to get started because we're late, and um, and I want to get cracking with you guys. Uh, so it's my understanding that you guys are you guys have just started your the the latest boot camp at JFDI. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, great. Um, so welcome, congratulations. I'm excited to see you guys and uh, hopefully work with you guys. This is a very awesome time for you um, to be able to focus exclusively on your business going forward. Um, I had the privilege of hanging out with uh, one of the sessions um, I think maybe six months ago, a year ago or so, and I uh, just had a blast. So I think you guys are in for a real treat. Uh, my expertise is in developing customers. So I'm sure a number of you are fantastic at developing products, um, which is a skill that, that, um, that I have as well. But it turns out developing products is significantly easier than developing customers. Um, many of us went to school for computer science and know how to program and code, and it's a lot of fun. Um, but building a business is significantly different. So one of the things I want to talk about today is some of those differences and how you can go about uh, tackling those differences. So the first thing I want to do is uh, I want to talk about failure in startups because I'm sure it's something that you guys are all familiar with, but I want to give you a new perspective on it. So we all know that the failure rate is extremely high for startups. Um, anyone want to guess what the failure rate is for funded startups, as in startups that actually achieve funding? So as if you guys went out and got funding after this round, what, what the failure rate is, give or take? 70%? Okay. And what, what else we got? 90%. 90%, great. Give me three more. 88. 88, okay, great. And two more? 99. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then one more. One more. One more. 99.9. <laughs> all right. So you guys are all skewing very high in terms of failure rate, um, and that's that's you guys are all close. 75% is the number that I've seen published. Um, but this is after funded startups, so that even even those guys, those of you who go and get funding, will likely fail more than not. Um, so the question is, what's your relationship to that failure going to be? What most companies do is they come up with some awesome idea, they build it. If they're one of the, I don't know, 10% or so that get funding, they go out and get funding, and then they keep going, and then they'll eventually fail. They'll succumb to that failure um, because they're consistently looking at their product, building onto their product, and then hoping that their product attracts its customers. So that's one way to approach failure is just to run away from it and become ultimately a victim to it. The other way to approach failure is to recognize that it will happen to you. You will do things that will fail. Everyone raise your right hand. Everyone raise your right hand. Okay, and repeat after me. I will fail. I will fail. One more time with your left hand. Left hand up, everybody. With your left hand up and a little bit louder. I will fail. I will fail. Fantastic. Okay, so you guys get it. You are now all failures. Congratulations. Round of applause for yourselves for being failures. Round of applause. Okay, okay, very good. So if you recognize that you are destined to fail, you are destined to screw things up, you can take failure and turn it into your specific advantage, an advantage that you have over all the other startups that are out there. If you know you can fail, you're going to fail, you can attack that failure. You can understand what are the weakest points in my business. And you can go and strengthen those weak points in your business. Now again, most of us do the opposite. We, we, we have all intentions. We're like, oh, yeah, I want to strengthen my business. But we say, screw it. I've got a great idea for a product. We go and build, 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 and hope that eventually customers come. Because if you build the right thing, customers come. Build, you know, build the product and they will come. That never happens. Build a great product and it will, it will sell itself. That doesn't happen. Not in the real world. Failure happens in the real world. That's what we see. So what we want you guys to do is to understand that you're going to fail and I want to give you a system so that you can embrace that failure and turn it in to your own success. Everyone say yes. 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 Everyone say yes. Yes. Very good. Okay. So here's what I want you to think about in terms of failure. There are four big risks that every startup venture has. Everyone say four. 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 Okay, great. Anyone know how many boxes are on the business model canvas? 
Nine. Nine. That's right, a nine. There are nine boxes on the business model canvas, and we're cutting those into four. So the business model canvas is full of nine awesome things that are risky, but I'm focusing you just on these four. And those four, are you ready? Write these down. These are important. You will be tested on this. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Here we go. Number one. Can you guys read this, or is it backwards? Yeah, we can read this. You can read it. Okay. Number one. What does it say? Problem. 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 Great. Okay. So anyone, so tell one, tell me what they think this means in terms of what, what the, uh, what the risk is. Uh, you are not defining your problem really well. Uh, I, I, that was, I think that was close. I couldn't quite hear. Can you get a little closer to the microphone? Okay. Uh, getting the problem wrong. Getting the problem wrong. Okay. Tell me more about that. Uh, well. Um, yeah, you probably identify only part of the problem or your problem definition is not something that is big enough for the customer to really pay you. That's beautiful. That's gorgeous. Thank you very much. Round of applause to whoever said that. Yay, very good. Okay, so if you have defined a problem that is not big enough for your customer to pay you, you are going to fail. So if you do not define a problem that your customer has, that it's not a significant problem, you will fail. So that's the biggest source of failure. At the startups, we go build things that aren't solving a problem for customers. We build very cool things. We build things that look very nice, but they're not solving a big problem. So that's the first thing we need to do is validate that we're solving a big problem. All right, number two, the, the second biggest risk, second biggest source of failure for startups. Find customers. Someone tell me what they think this means. I'm just thinking of like the sales funnel. So um, why aren't getting their, their attention, interest, getting them to buy and that. That's fantastic. Yes. If we cannot attract customers, if we cannot find a sustainable scalable way to find our customers and tell them about the solution we have to their problem, we're going to fail. So there are a number of businesses where this is the biggest problem you will face. A dating website is a great example. There are lots and lots of better ways to do a dating website, but unless you can find enough customers to get critical mass, there's no business here. Unless you can find your customers, you've got no business. So this is the second source of failure. People will go out, build a great business, and then realize, I don't have a way to contact my customers. All right, number three, get paid. Someone tell me what they think this means. Find a business model. Say that again? Find a business model. Something business model. Fill me in, Fanny. What did he say? To find business model. To find business model. Tell me more about what that means. Linus, do you want to explain that? Well, if we have if we have a bunch of customers from and customers, and uh, they are not willing to pay, so what's there is no deal with this. I think I heard if you've got lots of customers but they're not willing to pay, you've got nothing? Something along those lines? Yeah. Yes, okay, round of applause. Yay! Round of applause. Yay, very good, very good. Okay, you get it. Yeah, so they can have a big problem. They can even say it's a big, big problem. You can find lots and lots of them, but if they're not going to pay you, you've got nothing. Now, I want to make it clear here that paying often means money, often means they're giving you real cash, but it doesn't have to. Sometimes people are paying us, as in like Facebook, they're paying us with their attention or they're paying us with their time. So as long as they're giving us something valuable that we can turn into cash, um, we need to make sure that they're paying us. So regardless of whether you're a free app or, or not, you need to be getting something valuable for your customer in order to, in exchange for solving their problem. And number four, solve the problem. What do you guys think this means? That your product should uh, really 
fit into the problem that you are defining. The solution that you have should uh, fit into the problem. I believe that's what that's it is. great. That's great. That's great. Okay. So round of applause. Very good. Good. Um, okay. So solving the problem is <laughs> is important. Um, it, it is what's going to make your. It's going to include. It's going to grow your channel significantly. When you solve the problem, it's going to enable viral growth, referrals, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so these are the big four risks. The places that every startup should start by rooting out that failure. Your failure is going to live in one of these four places. If you nail all four of these, failure has nowhere to hide. So that is your goal, to go out and in this time, go and make sure that you can solve all of these four things. Now, why is solving the problem, why have I listed that fourth? Someone, someone tell me why I put this last. <laughs> Without the first three, the fourth one isn't needed? Is that what I heard? Uh, no, it's quite opposite. Uh, if you get the first three things right, then the fourth one is probably done. The fourth one is done. Oh, interesting. Well, that, that could be the case. In some cases, if I understand the problem, I can find the customers and I can get them to pay me, I might be able to solve their problem. Um, typically, what I'm thinking about here for this fourth one is, is maybe we're actually writing some code or we're delivering some sort of service. This is where we actually sort of get down and solve the customer's problem. So maybe it's done in some cases, but a lot of times there's actually some work to be done here. So yeah, help me understand. Why, why is that one fourth? It, it depends a lot on the first three. So it solving depends a lot. Yeah. It depends upon defining which problem, how, or who, and through what transaction. Yeah, that's great. That you know, sometimes the problem that I'm solving changes what my solution is to that problem, right? And whether or not I can get paid for something or how much I'm going to get paid is going to change this. So that's fantastic. That's a really good insight. Um, and sometimes you're going to have to change where you find your customers, and that's going to change the problem that you solve. So that's that's these are that's those are both great reasons. Um, the last, the other reason I put this here is because it is not the riskiest thing. Oftentimes, we think as developers that our failure hides here. We're just concerned, oh my gosh, that I've got this great idea for, uh, for a product, and the thing that I'm most concerned about is that I can't write the code. But that's bullshit. <laughs> like, like, writing code is easy compared to all of these other things. I've done it. You've done it. We've all written code. It, unless you guys are doing something amazing with DNA sequencing or rockets, or DNA sequencing of rockets, uh, this isn't particularly difficult. You can do this stuff. I am almost guaranteed, I can, I can rest assured that you, that you guys can do these things. These things, these first three are the things that I'm most concerned about, and you should be too. This is probably where your failure is going to hide. So if you're going to attack your failure, I want you to really focus on, am I really solving a hard problem for my customers? If you are, where can you find them in a sustainable way? If you can find them in a sustainable way, will they pay you to solve the problem? And then only after you've done those three things, move on to solving the problem. All right. So I've just done a lot of talking, and I've said some things, hopefully, that have either um, that you don't believe, that you think are crazy, that you think are stupid, um, but hopefully it's new. So I would love to hear, before I go on, three questions about what I've just said and the more rude the questions are, the better. I will bring the camera around so anybody has any questions. Feel free to ask. It's not feel free to ask. This is not a request. I demand questions. I demand your questions about I what you think is questions. stupid here. Yeah. OK, question. Uh, can you give some more examples of a non Monetary way of getting paid. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to ask you, what do you think are non-monetary ways of getting paid? Um, contributing content. That's great. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah, I mean, if you have, like, Wikipedia, right? Like, some of the things that people are paying with are their ideas, their intelligence. Yelp is a great, another great model. You're getting paid. They're providing great content. That's awesome. What, what, what other ideas are out there? 
uh, giving testimonials, referrals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Um, yes, yeah, Stack Overflow, uh, those communities, Stack Exchange, they all have um, the community supported content. That's great. Um, virtual currency sometimes, you know, you do things in exchange for little tokens and goodies, and then sometimes eventually people will pay for those things. Sometimes you can uh, get them to pay you for actions as well. So they can pay you by referring you on to someone else. So who, who does that better than anybody that, that in exchange for providing free service, uh, they get you to share your stuff with someone else. All right. Facebook? Tell me about Facebook. Uh, I believe what you said was, uh, who allows you to share your stuff with other people, uh, you know, in return for giving you some services. I believe that is what Facebook is allowing us to do. Yeah, right. So Facebook does. Facebook enables us to, in in exchange for getting more service, sometimes you. I don't know if Facebook actually does this in the way that I'm thinking about, but I mean, you're you're absolutely right in that they do enable us to share content. Um, some ideas that come to my mind: Dropbox, right? Dropbox. You, you know, I don't pay for the service, but I give value back to back to Dropbox by sharing the service with other people. In exchange, I get more service. So I'm getting paid, in a sense, to share my content with other people. Yeah. Okay. So great question. Okay, two more questions. I think a lot of them have the question on how do you find the customers. <coughs> on how how to find the customers. That's a great great question. Um, let me ask you guys. How many customers have you guys had a chance to interview? Who who has interviewed? Raise your hand, and Fanny, I want you to pan the camera uh, around. Um, who has interviewed five or more customers one on one? We have one, two, three, four, five, five teams. Five teams. Okay. Seven teams. Seven teams. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Okay, keep your keep your hands up if you have interviewed twenty or more customers one on one. Okay. One, two, okay. Three, four. We have four teams. Okay, great. And then of those four, I will shout out the number. How many customers roughly have you guys interviewed one on one? How many guys? So how many interviews have you done? Uh, I think. Over a hundred. Okay, great. What else we got? About a hundred. About a hundred. Okay. Uh, about 25, 30. Okay. Great. Okay, so the guys who have done 100 interviews, um, and, and how do you guys find your customers? How do you guys find your customers? Yeah, first was when we were reading the prototype, uh, we used our, so ours is the product uh, which gets us to the doctors and patients. So one side is the doctors and hospitals, the other side is patients. Okay. So initially when we went about uh, doing this, uh, uh, we, we help patients get negotiated price when it comes to surgical treatments and they pay out of pocket for private paying patients. And so initially we used 50 of our doctor friends as the initial prototype building customers who we did not take money from, but we used them in building the prototype. So we, we told the problem, we took the problem from the patient, we did a marketing search, went to the doctor saying this is how the problem is and this is what we want to build. And then came up with the right flow for building the, then we used the technology to build it. And then right. after, after that we launched it in a, a mega launch where we had a press release and then after that it was carried by all the press and then doctors and hospitals started signing up. That's when we had one-to-one -one interaction because it, it's an online channel for them to sign up themselves. Once they give it, once once they sign up, there's a lead which comes up, comes out to us, and then we use the lead and close the lead with them, by going and meeting them personally and discussing how our product is and what exactly it does, what are the benefits for them, how to use it, and how much they should pay. Gotcha. Okay, great. So that's that's a way to go get customers. If you go and and go build a build a product, and hopefully the product resonates with people, and then you can go get a press release, and then you, once you get people signed up, you can have your one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, this is sort of like a combination of like, hey, 
Um, we're we're gonna sort of run from the failure. We're gonna try and build something, and then if we if we get lucky and we hit some right customers, then we'll go back and we'll interview them. And that's that's an awesome way to go get customers, um, to go find the customers. The the other gentleman who had done o over a hundred interviews, real real quickly in ten seconds, how did you go find those customers? Sure. One way is to go get the customers from competitors, or competitors. Mm. Find them very easily. Another way is a uh, customer base that we already built up from a pre-given model. So we see a similar thing to the existing customer base. Another way is uh, advertising through uh, Facebook, Facebook ads, and other online uh, customer acquisition. Great. OK. All right, great. So then you guys, um, that, that's an awesome way to go outbound, to go search for them in a competitor's space to go use ads as if as if you were already launched a product. Those are fantastic ways to do it. Um, one of the clues that I use in finding customers is I go back to the to the original problem interviews. So it sounds like all of you guys have done some interviews. And one of the most powerful ways to understand where your customers are is to ask them. So when I do an interview I'll often ask, you know, what's the hardest part about your job or your role? I'll ask, why is that hard? I'll ask, tell me a story about the last thing that happened, last time that happened, and then I'll ask about alternative solutions they're using, and I'll ask, how did you find out about those alternative solutions? I'll ask a question like, when's the last time you heard about a new tool? When's the last time you installed a new piece of software to try and solve this problem? And then where did you find out about those? So a lot of times I ask my own customers what, what channels they're hanging out in, what tools they're using to find out about new services, and then I'll use those to reach out and find them. Does that make sense? Yes. OK. OK, great. So uh, and then one more question. One more question about, about this whole process, about these four steps. Someone tell me that I'm wrong. Someone tell me that this is in the wrong order, that no one, that one of these should be in a different order. That. No one, no, no one thinks that who, the guys who wrote code. So somebody here wrote code. So someone, the guy who just sat up here and told me how he got a hundred customer interviews, tried to solve this problem before he tried to solve this problem, presumably or one of these problems. So, so, tell me why you did that. Why did you do that? And would you do it again? So why did you choose to solve the problem first before you get paid? What did you do? Solve the problem first mm -hmm. before you get paid. So this was a, this was a new service, isn't it? This was a very new service, and we had we uh, we we had a chicken and egg issue here. Uh, we had to go by the model of having some some of A, some of B, more of A, more of B, and all of A, all of B model. Mm. So that's how we had to progress. It, it was not it was not in uh, a way where you say that we have a uh, solution in mind, pay us first, and then we will solve your problem. That that was not the way to go about it because we had to believe in ourselves first, identify the problem, talk to the customer, talk to the patients whether this is something you've provided if they are going to use it. Once they, there was a good base of patients saying that yes, if there is anything above 19,000 Indian rupees, that is that's around uh, uh, I should say 500 dollars, uh, I would use your service to get a negotiated price. So when we knew the problem. We went to the doctor saying there are a lot of patients who actually want discounted pricing. Are you willing to give a discounted pricing? Yes. Now, we, this was happening manually all these days. The patient had to go himself, shop around, and find a price code and then take one of the best options. So then we had to build a code, we had to build a technology platform which connects both the patients and lets patients and doctors talk to each other. And then once this is done, is when they see the model working, is when they pay. And that's how we started getting the payment after we built the Solution. Gotcha. Okay, great, great. Thank you for that story. Um, okay, round of applause for the story. Everyone, I want, I want, I want to thank you for sharing. Okay, so in this situation, he's 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 talked to someone. They have said yes, we will pay you, but he's thought that they won't pay him until he builds a solution, and so he goes out and builds a solution. And in his case, he's got a, a two-sided market, and so he feels like he needs to bring one side to the table before the other. Um, so that's that's great, and in some cases you may end up switching the orders of these things, right? That's okay. 
Um, I might argue that, that, that maybe getting payment is a little more scary to me than actually solving the problem. Um, so maybe I would try and get paid first, and I would try and make doctors pay me, as in, hey, okay, great, we're going to try and build this thing, but I need you to put down a letter of intent or some sort of promise that you're going to pay me. If they don't pay me, if I get rejected ten times, fine. Then I'll go build the service and I'll try again. Um, but that's just to say I, I want to just really call out that as developers, our natural instinct is to want to build things. Um, but that's often not the riskiest assumption. But you can switch them around. Okay, so if these are the four things that you um, that I think are the biggest risks, I want to talk about what happens after you validate one of these risks. Um, and there's a, there's a term that I like to use. It's called, let me see if I can write this out here, the riskiest assumption experiment. Okay, so someone tell me what they think this term means. Riskiest assumption experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, you think the, uh, you, you think the customers will pay, you assume they'll they'll pay, and then what happens? And then you build a product. You experiment with building a product. Okay. Okay, great. What other definitions do we have for the riskiest assumption experiment? Uh, you want to validate the uh, of all the assumptions that you have, you want to validate the one that you believe is the riskiest. And you uh, go in the market and conduct an experiment to validate that riskiest assumption. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Round of applause for that person. Okay, so yes, this is this is the definition that I like best. And this is how I think about everything in my startup. That I've always got a list of risky assumptions, right? Things that I'm concerned about. But I only focus my energy on testing one at a time. And the way that I do that is I build my riskiest assumption experiment. So if I'm trying to validate that the customer has a significant problem, my riskiest assumption experiment is that I'm going to interview 20 people over the next two weeks, and I need five of them to say that X problem is a significant problem to them without my prompting. No, the success, the, the success metric, it can be whatever you want. I just made it up here, five out of 20. Um, but the idea is that this is my riskiest assumption experiment. I'm going to interview people, and I want people to say this is a problem. If I validate that and say, boom, I'm done, if my next riskiest assumption is that I can find these customers, then I'm going to build a riskiest assumption experiment that's going to be the simplest thing I can do to validate this experiment. So let's say I'm trying to build an app for people with ADD so they can be to appointments on time. And I want to try and see, can I find people that have ADD? And I'll put up a little landing page, and I'll put an email sign up, and then I'll say, okay, my goal is in the next week to get 1,000 people to the website, and I want 10% of them to sign up for the beta invite. And I, that will be my riskiest assumption experiment. And then after that, if I, if I say, you know what, this is no longer a risky assumption, I want to get paid. My next risky assumption, so let me, let me ask you guys, what would be, let's say I'm building an app, an iPhone app, it's going to try and help people be to appoint, get to appointments on time. I validated that it's a problem. I validated that I can find people that have ADD, and now I want to validate that I can get paid. What's a way that I can validate, what's, the, what's a riskiest assumption experiment that I can run? You could probably go beyond your... Sorry, can you uh, say that again for me? Yeah, you could probably go beyond your early adopters and try to see if this problem can... Uh, if this problem is something that is faced by the mainstream and not just a small minority of people. Okay, so one way is to go from a niche to a larger segment. So tell me how, how will that, if I do that, will that help me understand whether or not I can get paid? Yeah, probably, because uh, your early adopters and your niche market that you're targeting, uh, you said that you've validated that you can get paid by them, but you can still not be sure if the problem is uh, large enough for you to be paid by a large number of people. So I believe that would be a risky assumption at this stage. 
Okay, fair. So, so you're citing another, a different risky assumption, so that's fine. I'm going to put that down as number five here. Then I can even say, I'm going to just call it growth at this point. Can you guys see that? Growth. Um, so can we actually grow to a sustainable size? That's fair. Um, and if you think that that is your riskiest assumption, then that, that's, you, know, you can go out and do that. One caveat, real quick. The way that we see growth happen is not by big chunks of the market at once. The way we see initial growth happening is we start with a niche, and then that niche grows to in a second niche, and then a third niche, and it's niche by niche by niche. Facebook doesn't start by getting all users on at once. Facebook starts at one college, and then a second college, and then a third college, and then lots and lots of colleges. So, uh, so just a real quick reason. I think this is a this is a fantastic risky assumption. It's absolutely on my list, no higher than five. Um, and the reason being the um, innovators dilemma. Excuse me. This is not. This is crossing the chasm. Um, we have to find early adopters first. The way you find early adopters is by speaking their language. And the way you speak to an early adopter and that with their own language is by niching specifically to them. So I would highly recommend running through all four of these with a niche, a very specific niche, and then test whether you can get your second niche and your third niche. But still, that said, I think it's a great risky assumption. If, however, I wanted to test this one, the get paid, What's a way that I can, what's the riskiest assumption ex experiment that I can build to test whether I can get paid for my app um, that gets people uh, to places on time? A couple of different ways. Uh, the most direct is you go to a potential customer and you show them either a mock-up or a prototype of that and you ask them to get paid. Okay, so I, so I can show a prototype to someone and then I can ask them if they would pay, is that what I heard? You show them like a mock-up, basically pitch to them this, this service or the product. Right? Mm -hmm. That's great. OK. Uh, yeah, so that, oh. Yeah. OK, so that's fantastic. So you can go to someone, you can ask them. Now, there's, there's a funny thing that happens with money, and then asking qu uh, customers any questions at all about the future. So when we're asked a customer a question like, would you use blah, blah, blah? Or would you pay blah, blah, blah? Or how much would you pay blah, blah, blah? We're asking them to predict the future. And the results here are almost always wrong. Because we have no idea, really, would we use a product. We have no idea how much we would actually pay. Like Some people pay easily, gladly, happily. $600 for a little computer, you know, that sits in your pocket. And, and the very first version drops calls a lot. And so if you ask someone, would you pay $600 for a phone that drops your calls all the time? The answer is going to be no. But when you call it an Apple iPhone and it's beautiful and gorgeous and has a wonderful marketing campaign, the answer is often yes. So, so I found... I'm sorry. Can you just add real quick? Yeah. So for that reason, what you might want to do, sometimes I would suggest it doesn't hurt to try to ask anyway and see what they say. But then what you want to do is back up and say, you know, what have you paid for in the past? Something that's an alternative solution, right? Mm -hmm. Somehow we're solving and addressing the problem already. Mm -hmm. What have they actually paid for for the next best thing that's available out there? And use that as a fair reference. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic data point to get. How much have they paid in the past? There's a notion called anchor pricing. I won't get into that now, but it's extremely important. And you can figure out what someone is anchored at by asking, how much have they paid in the past? That's great. Um, as to whether or not to ask the first question, I don't even ask it because it can be misleading. And why ask a question that's just going to give you junk data anyway? Because especially because we are all emotional beings, someone's going to say, oh, yeah, I would totally pay $1,000 for that thing. And we're going to think, oh, my gosh, there's someone out there who would pay $1,000. And they never are. So I don't even ask the question. And I, I would recommend not asking the question, but that, that other question, what have you done in the past, that's a fantastic question to ask. Um, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys one risky assumption experiment here. That is to take pre-orders for the app, right? I can take an app, an iPhone app, and I can generate pre-orders for it. 
I won't do it through the App Store. I'll just put together a landing page, and I'll take pre-orders, and there are great tools out there that can do this for me. One's called Celery. Celery. If you go to tricelery.com, they have a really great uh, plug-and-play you know, widget that you can plug on a page, and you can start taking pre-orders immediately. Uh, so tricelery.com. Um, and I, you can take pre-orders for an app. You can take pre-orders for anything. And now I know whether or not I can get paid. Now, the actual number is probably going to be significantly lower than in real life, maybe half, maybe a third. But if I can't get anybody to pre-order, I'm scared. I'm worried that something is wrong. I'm worried that I'm not going to get it paid. But if I can get people to pay, I've validated this assumption before I've written any code. And that's ideal, because we can go and attack these failures as quickly as possible. We can run through this entire thing in three weeks and know that, that hey, if we build this thing, we're going to make money. All right, so then the last one, number four. What's, what's the riskiest assumption experiment for number four here? Can we solve the problem? There's another, there's another very common term for this thing, for the riskiest assumption experiment that goes down here. It's a very common term. It has three letters in it. Which starts from? <laughs> starts with... OK, everyone throw out... It, it's, it's a lean startup term. Everyone throw out every lean startup term you know. MVP, that's it. MVP. <laughs> okay, the MVP, MVP is a riskiest assumption experiment. It's the least thing you can do to make sure that solving the problem is no longer the riskiest assumption that you have. So interviews, channel testing, or landing page sign up, getting paid, pre-orders, MVP, and then growth hacking things. These are all things that you can do to go and test your riskiest assumptions. So what I want to leave you guys with is basically this entire model of operating. When I was at um, JFDI last time, there, there were a couple things that were, th that were the most confusing to teams there. And I actually used um, basically half, half of my blog is built off of working with teams from JFDI. So I'm going to ask Fanny to send you guys all out some blog posts that were derived from my conversations at previous JFDI teams. Um, and, uh, and that's going to help you understand who to interview, understand how to interview, make sure you're doing all of the interviews as well as possible. Because a lot of companies I've talked to have done interviews, but they've done interviews where they're asking questions about the future, or they've done interviews where they're asking leading questions. And oftentimes, they're hiding their failure and they haven't actually discovered a real problem. So we're going to get you all that information. But what I want you guys to leave with is this understanding of Lean Startup, where all we're doing is we're testing one assumption at a time, and that one assumption is our riskiest one. After we test that assumption, we go and we build the simplest way to solve, to go validate our next riskiest assumption. Yeah? Um, okay, so in the next minute, I would love any other closing questions that you guys might have about this process or anything else having to do with customer development. Can you share some of the coolest MVPs that you've come across? Coolest MVPs that I've come across. When I say that, like, you know, like, you know there's examples of the drop-off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's an example that I love. Um, there's a company called Moving Worlds, and it's at movingworlds.org. Uh, I'm not going to bring it up here, but you can you can check it out. Movingworlds.org. Okay, Th this team is a social enterprise, which means that they are th they are not out to make money. They are out to have a social impact in the world. So their whole goal in life is when, when they go to investors, they say, I am not here to generate a 10x return on your investment. I am here to go make an impact on the world. 
So try, go ahead, think about it. Think about trying to go to an investor and say, I want your money, and I'm not going to give it back in tenfold. At best, I'll give you back two or three times that return, right? So already they have this huge challenge that they're up against. Uh, now, imagine that they don't have a developer. They're just two business guys. One's a marketer, one's a volunteer. And what they're doing, they're basically, they are... Uh, Match.com meets the Peace Corps. So if you've got some expertise and you want to volunteer that abroad in exchange for international travel, they'll hook you up with volunteering opportunities. So what they did was they put together a landing page. And if you go to movingworlds.org, you'll see it. It's a beautiful landing page where you go and you type in your, uh, your email address. And then what happens after that is they contact you via email. They ask you for your phone number or they ask you for your Skype number, and then they call you. And they ask you, what kind of opportunities are you looking for? What kind of skills do you have? And then they go call people that might have opportunities for that person, and they match them up manually. This is called a concierge MVP. Basically, they fake it till they make it. They just go hack it all the way themselves together. Um, and with that, they were able to get 50 paying customers before they'd written any code at all. And with that 50 paying customers, they, were, they went out and they tried to raise a quarter of a million dollars. And the truth is they failed. They, they did not raise a quarter of a million dollars. They raised $350,000. So they were able to oversubscribe their round as a social enterprise before they wrote any code at all. Now, they validated that they could solve the problem, but they didn't write any code at all. So the coolest MVPs I've seen are MVPs that validate that you can solve the problem but don't use any code. And the reason being that code, isn't, code doesn't solve new problems. Code automates solutions that we already understand. Code is a way to make a process more efficient once we already understand what that process is. It's not a way to invent a new process. Fantastic question. Was how much did you say it was 50000 Was it target? I'm sorry, uh, the, the amount they raised was $350,000. i am not sure if that was the question that you asked. No, you, you said they wanted to raise less than that, though, right? What yeah, they, the want, they wanted to raise a quarter million, uh, ah. but then by the time they closed their round, they, had, they were oversubscribed. More people wanted, because they saw the traction they were getting, um, more people wanted to be a part of their organization than they expected. Got it. Yeah. All right, guys, so I'm going to sign off here, but I'm going to make sure that Fanny gets you guys the, the blog post that uh, talk about who to interview and how to interview. Um, and then I also want you guys to know I'm going to get you a link where you guys can set up Skype calls with me anytime. Um, so you guys can, you know, if you ever want to chat about how to talk to customers, how to find them, how to run any of these experiments, you set up some time on Skype and then we'll chat. So I'm good? Quick, quick uh, mini blurb or pitch on your own, uh, on what you're doing. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, I yeah. am. So I have a, um, I am a former developer at Microsoft. I left, I started a tech company. I spent 18 months and lots of my own money, and I failed miserably because I tried to build a product before I knew that there was a real problem. So my failure was hiding in here. Um, I've since then learned how to go root out that failure, and I turned that company around, and we now provide medical record processing for the Department of Defense. Um, but to be perfectly honest, that is a side gig at this point. It's on autopilot, and I don't really like the healthcare space. So it's doing its thing. It's fine. But I much prefer to help other entrepreneurs. Um, so now I spend my time uh, talking to founders one-on-one, -on -one, giving talks at accelerators, uh, working with enterprises about how to go and avoid the mistakes I made the first time around. So that's what I do. All right. Thanks, Justin. Thank you so much for your time. And sorry for the time zone difference. No worries. No worries. All right, guys. Best of luck to you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Justin. We'll catch up again by email. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you.